hello, you should be able to see the desktop and you should be able to hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, let me open up. Okay. Um, let's see. Today, we're going to start talking, go, go back to the render specifically instead of talking about events. Okay, so if you're working on the programming assignment and you have questions about events and event handling, please, you know, please uh, send me an email or, or whatever. You know, definitely ask questions about them. Okay, so um, what, let's see, first of all, I want to point out that uh, I changed the date of the exam to two weeks from Thursday. The programming assignment is due a week from Thursday. So that, so the program assignment will be due, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it was the 29th, let me check. Yeah, the homework assignment's due the 29th, a week from Thursday. And then the exam is set for two weeks from Thursday. And I'm almost done with the review problems. So definitely the review problems will be available by Thursday. Maybe they'll be up there even tomorrow. I, I'm, I'm working on them and I'm almost got them done. So the review problems will definitely be ready by tomorrow or, or I'm sorry, by Thursday, okay? And then, you know, as usual, the, the review problems, you can, you can work on them and get a sense of, you know, that'll be, get a sense of what, what the exam will be like. And remember the exam is just gonna be essentially like a take home exam. You know, uh, you know, it'll become available on this day after class and it'll be due at, at midnight. I did that in my, in my other class and it worked well. We'll have class like usual, but then the exam will be available after class and you have the whole rest of the day to do it, okay? And it's not meant to be like a 10 hour exam. It's like a, a one hour exam, but you'll have just the whole rest of the day to do it. And then you'll send it back to me. Yeah, I'll give you more detailed instructions, but you know, so you, you'll write up the exam either on you know, pieces of paper or you can use Word or you can use pretty much anything you want, but you have to, you'll have to send them back to me. Okay, we'll talk about that in detail when we get closer to them. All right, so uh, that's important. So, you know, two weeks from today or two weeks from Thursday. Okay, and... I want to start talking about uh, clipping again. Go back to talking about clipping. Uh, actually, let me download renderer one and three. Okay. I want to look at what was wrong in renderer one and see, and then you know, start talking about how we're going to fix it. So here was renderer one. And we haven't talked about it for a while, but there was a problem with the way we did clipping. Okay. Now, um, Actually, um, render two is interactive. So I, I sh render two is a better one to download because it's hard. Render one isn't got the, anything interactive in it. So let me download render two. It's just easier to use. Same re render one and render two, exact same renderer. It's just the render two's got the interaction built into it. Okay, then. Okay, now, you know, right now it's not a problem. We we if you turn if you don't have clipping turned on, you get this kind of weird wrapping. That's just the it, that's the way the frame buffer stored in a an array. And if you turn clipping on, you know, you, then you don't see that wrapping. The wrapping is not really a problem. It's just the fact it's just because of the way we uh, store the 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 two dimensional frame buffer in a one dimensional array. So that when you go off that row, you're really just appearing in the next row. You're, you're actually just appearing in the next row down. This this here is actually one row of pixels below that row of pixels. Yeah, and if you look real carefully, you can see yeah that row of pixels there comes in over here one row below. Okay. So now what the problem was, you don't see it in this example. The problem was 
in the renderer one, actually what I'll do, see, in renderer one, there was this something wrong and something wrong. Okay, and those those wrong things are still in renderer two. In fact, I could have put, probably should have put these two in here too, because the something wrong is still there in renderer two. Okay, so let's look at what something wrong does. Okay, if you run this, whoops, what did I do wrong? Oh, um, I keep forgetting. Yeah, uh, look, you, know, you guys, you guys don't probably have this problem, but look, you, you should. You know, it's worth pointing out what went wrong here. Error: cannot access scene. Base class, bad, you know, bad class file. You know what? How do you get bad class file? Does anybody remember? I've had, I've, I've, I've made this mistake before. Does anybody remember? What do you start thinking about? when you see weird error messages like bad class file. Then remember what what's going on here. Uh, is the file not built, Professor? Pardon me? You're, you're back. Uh, is the file not uh, compiled? No, I, co I, I compiled it and I got this. Comp when I tried to compile it, I got this weird error message bad class yeah, so file. The class, that scene file, uh, th maybe the class file is not generated? No. Because it's not the, able to identify the class. Look at the next error message. What does it mean by that? Did you use a different version of the JVM? Yeah, I've got I've got multiple JVMs on this machine and sometimes and, and, and I keep sometimes sometimes I accidentally switch between them. Okay, now how did I switch between them? A minute ago, I ran a program, this, uh, this one, okay? How did I run it? See, there's the class file. How did I run that program? Well, you used your uh, batch file. I, I used the batch file, okay. And then you used the, uh, the, the IDE. There are two different versions. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the IDE and the batch file are using two different versions of the JDK. Yeah, and, and you always have to be aware of these kind of things. You, know, you, you, can act, you, can, you can easily have a computer with multiple JDKs on it. And these kind of things, cause, these can cause mysterious bugs and mysterious errors. You know, machines having multiple JDKs. Um, when I use this build script, you know, just real quick, I'm using, well, which JDK am I using there? Uh, the one in your path? Yes, the one in my path, okay? The one that if I come up here and call, bring up a command prompt and type echo Oops. If I ask the Windows operating system to show me the path Oh, what did I do wrong? See, right at the beginning of my path, there's the Amaretto JDK at the beginning of my path. So it's using that JDK, the one in my path, okay? All right, so the batch script used the JDK in the path. So, so the batch script, so then you have to, you know, if you wanna know which JDK this is using, it didn't say which one it's using, so it's the one in the path. Then you can go to my text pad, oops, and the IDE, you know, whatever IDE you're doing, you have to go know how it works. Here's where my ID has its tools. Here's the compile Java tool. And this one gets, yeah, this one's a little bit tricky because it doesn't, it's not even clear. See, it just says it's using Java C, which you would think it means it's the one in the path. But, but like almost all IDEs, they hide things from you. Uh, TextPad has internal to itself somewhere that it knows where the IDE is, where the JDK is. So TextPad is, it's using the JDK it found when I installed TextPad, that's what it's doing. And, and a lot of IDs are like this. When you install the IDs, they look for a JDK and they latch onto one. And they, it's not always clear, like this one, it's not clear which one it latched onto. And I don't even know how to ask TextPad, TextPad which JDK did you latch onto? I think you might have to go edit the registry to change that. I don't even know if you can modify it without changing the registry, okay? 
So your IDE is latched onto one JDK, and the bill, that's why bill scripts are considered better than IDEs. This is one of the problems with IDEs. You don't always have real good control, or it can be confusing to set an IDE to, to, uh, to a particular JDK. Okay, so I got a weird error message. These, two different ver these are two different version numbers from the different JDKs, you know, 52 and 55. One of them is Java 8 and one of them is Java 11. Okay, uh, see, I think this one should be Java 8. Yeah, now, you know, again, why doesn't that just say 8? Why does it say, notice that I, I went from 8 to 11. And if you go from 52 to 55, that's like going from 8 to 11. That's three more, okay? But why are they using the numbers 52 and 55 when you're using JDK 8 and JDK 11? Just more weird stuff, yeah, just more weirdness. JDKs have version numbers that aren't anything like the JDK version number. Yeah. JDK 8 is version 52. JDK 11 is version 55. Okay, so the way I can fix that is I could either build the program using the build script or just clean out all the class files. Okay, now I've cleaned out all the class files that were built up here in the renderer. So I cleaned up all the class files and now I'm going to start from scratch, build everything up with the IDE. Now I'll just build everything with this. Now, see, no problem now because I cleaned everything up. That's why you also want your build system should always have a clean command, something that'll clean everything out. The word clean came from make. The make people invented this idea. You call it clean. You had something called make clean. So, so the terminology is usually clean for deleting all the artifacts. People use the phrase artifact to mean things that your build system builds. In our case, our only artifacts are, are um, class files. But in a more elaborate thing, you could have library files, jar files, class files, resource files. So you want to clean up all the artifacts created by the build system. So you can, you can create, you can do a clean build. Okay, so now I have a clean build. All right, then if I run this program, it hangs. There's something wrong, and, and it's, it's, it's in an infinite loop. It's not really in an infinite loop. It's in a long loop. It's gonna eventually terminate, just I'm not sure when. Now what's going on? Why has this got to do with clipping? Why have I got a clipping problem? Okay, okay now let me close that and draw a little picture. Okay. We're clipping in the rasterizer, okay? So one picture I could draw to remind you how we're doing clipping is that if this is the, oops. Um, if this is the image plane, okay, you have the view rectangle in the image plane. There's the view rectangle that goes from, that goes from negative one to one, okay? And from negative, from positive one, negative one this way, okay? And what we're doing is if somebody gives us a line and that line goes like this, we're just gonna rasterize the whole line, start here, and every time we, we find a pixel, we ask the pixel, are you inside the frame buffer or not? So we just walk this line and actually, this this walking the line isn't really in this pic. It's it's in the um, it's it's not so much in this plane where we would be walking this line in the uh, what do we call it the the pixel plane, the plane of dots, the plane that represents pixel dots. But we walk this whole line, and if this line goes out for a really long distance, we have to keep walking this line, walking this line, walking this line, walking this line. Computing pixels and then not putting them in the frame buffer. Compute a pixel, not put them in the frame buffer. And that's what this program's doing. It's actually generated a line that stretches a huge distance out, okay? And it's trying to walk that line. It'll eventually get to the end of the line. So it's not really in an infinite loop. It'll just eventually get to the end of the line, but it might take hours to get there. We really should be clipping this off here and not rasterizing all this stuff here. That's what we want to eventually do. 
is get to the clipper where it, it clips here and it doesn't rasterize this. Now there's actually kind of a funny subtlety to this problem, okay? The actual line is not long, okay? The line actually, if you look at it, it appears to start at near the origin, okay? So the line, no, it seems to start near the origin. That's a point really close to the origin. And then it goes out to one, one. So it looks like the line is actually starts near the origin and goes up to this point here. So how did it get to be really super long? If the line seems to go from here to here, okay, but the line is, see, look where its Z coordinate is. The line isn't in this plane here. It isn't in the projection plane. It's near the Z equals zero plane. Okay, so let's draw a different picture. Let's draw a picture that shows us projection. Here's the Z axis, the actual, the negative Z axis. So there's the negative Z axis. And then over here, I'll put the, this would be the Y axis <coughs> at the origin. Okay. So you can call this one, that's the vertical axis, that would be the y-axis. Okay. Now, here is the, let me use a, a thinner line. Oh, let's see, how do I get? Over here is the projection plane. I use a thin line to represent the projection plane. So that's at z equals negative one. So that's at negative one, okay? And the view rectangle, the view volume would be a 45 degree line going out like this. Oops. Okay. Here's the the view volume goes out like this. You see the camera sees what's between there and the camera sees what's between there and there. Okay. All right. So like a, a point, a point right there, you know, it gets projected to there. Okay, so you can, you know, we project down to here. So this line here represents this plane over here. This is the, this is the view plane. Okay, and that's this plane here. This plane here is the, the edge of the view plane. See here you're seeing the edge of the view plane. Okay, so this is the edge of the view plane. And this is looking at face on to the view plane. Okay. Now, the line we're interested in, this line here, okay, it's, okay, I can't see its x coordinate because this x coordinate is coming out towards us over here. But notice that its y coordinate is very close to the origin and its z coordinate is very close to the origin. Okay. So this point, okay, now this point here, it's at 1, 1 but it's also very close to the origin. So this line kind of looks like this, okay? It starts real close to the origin and goes essentially straight up. Okay, we, don't, we ignore the x-coordinate, just look at the y-coordinate. It starts near the origin and goes straight up, okay? So the line would look like this. We're looking at a line that kind of goes, starts down here and goes straight up. Doesn't it, it, it goes straight up. Okay. But what do we need to do? We need to project it to the view plane. Okay. So this line segment I drew here wasn't right. It, it, this is the line seg, this, this line segment's behind the view plane. It needs, it sees behind the view plane. It now needs to be projected into the view plane. Okay. Now, 
you project from the origin over to the view plane. So let me use a thin line for projection. This point here, this point here projects to about there. See, I project to there. But now watch, what, where does this point project to? This point, you start here, you go through that point, and you project out here to a gazillion miles away. You see, see how the, this, you have to really see what I mean. Remember, it's, it's obvious over here. You project from here to your point, and you see where it crosses the view plane. So if I want to if I want to project that point, I start here. I've got a weird memory of when you clicked on things. Okay, like this point here, I start at the origin. I go out to that point, and it projects to there. Another point down here. If I had a point down here, yeah, you know, what does that pro project to? Yeah, you know, that projects. You start here and you go. You start here and you project that point to there. Okay. What about a point down here? You know, a point down here. What does it proje project to? A point down there, it would project to something outside of the the view, see it's outside the view volume, but it would project to, it'll project to this one here, which is outside of the view volume. Now get, now think about that line. It's real close to the, the or it's real close to the, the, the camera plane. This is the plane, the camera's sitting in looking there. This vertex projects to there, but this vertex up here, you go from there. I'll, I'll draw it a little bit of it. You start here, and you go up to there, and you keep going, you know, and it'll eventually hit the view plane tremendously far away from the x axis. That's how I got the long line over here. I didn't, I didn't create a long line. I created a short line. The short line is this line here, but that line is almost in the z equals zero plane. So it's actually behind the view plane. When it gets projected into the view plane, this point projects pretty much almost forward, but this point projects really, 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 really far out, okay? Now, if you run the program, you see that calculation happen. Okay, see how that point projected to something? See, see point zero, there's two, two vertices, vertex zero, index zero and index one, okay? Notice that this one rounded to the origin. It, it, I, I'm only showing five decimal places here. The point actually wasn't at the origin. See, it was point zero, 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 two. But I'm only showing five decimal places, so it rounded to look like it was at the origin. Then the other point was at one one, okay, okay. But then, okay, the one that was near the origin projected to two two negative one, okay. That yeah, it just projected, it not it it didn't project weirdly. But look at this one, it projected to a huge number. You know, count how many zeros there are there. So right now the rasterizer is trying to rasterize from this projected point, two, two, out to this point, which is, I don't know how many zeros there are there. Yeah, that's a lot of pixels it's trying to walk. It's trying to walk from there to there because that's what this, this point here projected to this number really, really, really large out there. Okay, all right, so now this happens because of an animation. See, this line isn't a long line, but it becomes a long line in an animation when it's moving. When a line gets near the camera plane, projection does weird things to it. So if I had an animation where I had a line segment, this line segment here was, say, moving away from, well, it was moving towards the camera. So imagine this line segment started out here, and then it was moving towards the camera. 
at some point it gets real close to the camera plane and at that point it gets projected to crazy numbers but at the same time it's outside of the view volume you know it should be clipped you know once it crosses the once once the line segments outside the view volume it should be clipped okay so we need to actually the problem is with our clipper it's not with projection the problem is the projection is doing the right thing the rasterizer is doing the right thing it's just the clipping is being done too late. It's being done after we, while we're rasterizing. We need to clip the line after it's been projected. After a line has been projected to the view plane, see, after this thing gets projected to the view plane, we want to clip it in the view plane, okay? Because then we know that we know exactly what part of it is outside. We'll know, what, we'll know what's outside of the view rectangle. So we should do clipping after projection and before rasterization. Now, um, let me draw another picture. Okay. Um, Here's the two-dimensional projection picture, not the three-dimensional one, just the two, just the two-dimensional rest projection picture. Okay, and then there's the view volume. Then the view volume, you know, why is it doing that to me? Okay. Then the view volume is this 45 degree line here and this 45 degree line here. Okay. There's the view volume. Now, suppose I have a line segment. I want to talk about when. <laughs> this thing, rem it's got a weird timing delay. When you draw a line, it remembers that line for a certain amount of time. And then it stops remembering it. So like now, if I change the line thickness, it won't affect that line because I think I waited long enough at this point. Okay, so it didn't. Now, here's a line that needs to be clipped, okay? The question is, when should we clip it? We could clip it in this picture here. So we could clip it right there. Or we could project it. Here's the projection plane. Yeah. Another possibility is that we could project this line to there and to, didn't wait long enough. Okay, I could clip the line there and clip it there and then project. Or I could project it to there and there and clip it there. Or I could rasterize it and clip it after I rasterized it. So I can clip before projection, right after projection, or clip during rasterizing, okay? So there's three times when I could clip, you know, so uh, you could clip before projection, you could clip after projection, or you could clip during rasterization. So there's three ways you can clip, okay? So you can clip one, two, or three. Okay, we've been doing three, and that's, not, that's a problem. Okay, so three is not a good idea. There's, there's a reason not to wanna do one. One seems like a good idea. Just go ahead and clip this line at that point there. 
Okay. And here's the reason we don't want to do that. We don't want to clip before projection. If I switch from perspective projection to parallel projection, this line has to change where it gets clipped at. Okay. Right now, this line clips there and there. Okay. Now, suppose parallel projection would be. Parallel projection would be something like this. Here would be the parallel projection. There's the top of the parallel projection. And here's the bottom of the parallel projection. Okay. If I project this, now here's my line segment. If I project it parallel projection, it goes to there and there. And then I end up with a different point to clip at. I would clip it right there, not clip it. You, know, you have to keep this picture straight. See, there's there's the clipping point for perspective projection. There would be the clipping point for parallel projection because that line would just go straight over to here and straight over to here. So if I clip before projection, I need two clipping algorithms, one for perspective projection and one for parallel projection. And I don't want two clipping algorithms. Now, a lot of renderers do do it that way. They 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 have to consider the they want the clipping all the clipping algorithm has to pay attention to whether you're doing perspective projection or parallel projection okay because because you end up the same line here ends up being clipped two different ways okay it gets clipped one way if it's perspectively projected and it's clipped a different way if it's parallelly projected okay so that's the problem with clipping before projection then you have to have both a perspective projection clipping and a per, and a parallel projection clipping okay Clipping during rasterization we know is not good because it, it leads to these lines that are way too long. So that leaves us with clipping after projection. We take the line segment, project it. Now, if we clip after projection, we clip, it doesn't matter if we're doing perspective or parallel projection, we clip to this these two lines here. There's the view rectangle. The view rectangles from here to here. So the view rectangle is the same whether we do perspective projection or parallel projection. So if we clip to the view rectangle, we don't have to worry about which projection we're doing. Okay, so we clip after projection. Now later on, we'll see that this is not really right either. There's actually a clipping stage between two and three. Well, actually you would think of it as, um, it's actually between one and two. There's going to be a, 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 a four-dimensional abstract space that sits between one and two. This is where rendering gets really weird. We're, we're going we're gonna to project to four-dimensional space. Right now, I, uh, we're projecting three-dimensional space to two-dimensional space. Here, I'm, I'm projecting two-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. To make it easier to draw a picture, I'm projecting two-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. We'll actually project three-dimensional space to four-dimensional space. And then we'll clip in four dimensional space. Some genius figured this out some years ago, and it works out really, really well. Okay, it turns out to be a brilliant idea, but you project from three dimensional space to four dimensional space, and then you clip in four dimensional space, and then, then you do projection. Again, you essentially do two, you do two projection steps from three dimensional space to four dimensional space, then clip then project from four dimensional space to two dimensional space and then and then rasterize all right so and that'll solve a problem that this this one has a problem too this projecting af, projecting after um, clipping after projection if we clip after projection like we're doing here there's still a problem with it but we don't we won't see what that problem is until a little bit later and then we'll solve that problem by using four dimensional space and it's amazing how much interesting math People in, you know, you, you wouldn't expect people writing games to all of a sudden be saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I want to write my game in four dimensional space. And, but that's exactly what somebody figured out at some point that rendering, you, know, you, you need a four dimensional space step in the middle of the rendering process. Your game is not really in four dimensional space, but the renderer has a four dimensional space step where it projects from three dimensional space to four dimensional space, does some work in the four dimensional space then projects back down to two dimensional space. And that's solved, and it's, that four dimensional space is actually called clip space. The, the phrase that people use for it is clip space because that's what one of its main jobs is to make the clipping algorithm work better. Okay, all right, so 
Okay, so we're going to solve our problem of lines. Remember, we're going to solve this problem of a line that's way too long that causes us to hang in the rasterizer because the rasterizer is trying to rasterize this long line. What we'll do is before that, we'll still have that real long line, but we'll clip it. After it's projected, before rasterizing it, we'll clip that line, and then it won't be very long. It'll clip to something normal, and then the rasterizer can deal with it. So after projecting it, it'll still be projected to an incredibly long line, but then, then we'll, we'll, we'll clip the incredibly long line and then rasterize what's left. Okay? All right. So that's the idea of what we want to do. Okay. Now, let's look at how the code works for it. Well, actually... There's a, oh, I, I, have, I didn't expand renderer three yet. Okay, so here's renderer three. I hadn't expanded it yet. Okay, there's a long document here that explains the clipping algorithm, okay? So this explains the clipping algorithm. And the clipping algorithm now is its own stage between projection and rasterization. So this is what's new, is that there's a clipping stage between projection. The clipping was built into the rasterizer. Now clipping is its own stage. It happens after projection before rasterization. So if you look in the render folder, in the pipeline folder, there's a new clip stage. And if you look at the pipeline, the pipeline now projects, clips, then rasterize. Okay. So the camera, I'm sorry, the, the rasterizer does, now it's a three-stage rasterization process. There's three pipeline stages. First you project. So there's the projection function, then there's the clip function, and then there's the rasterize function. And it's rasterizing what's been clipped. So now the rasterizer is never going to try to rasterize immensely long lines. The rasterizer does not change, and the projection does not change. Okay, we don't make any changes to the projection stage. We don't make any changes to the rasterizing stage. Well, we remove it's a bit. We move the we remove from the rasterizer the, the problem of it looking. It never. It doesn't check if pixels are outside the frame buffer anymore. Before the rasterizer, every time it was about to put something in the frame buffer, it would check if it's outside of it. Because if it was outside of it, it wouldn't put it in the in the frame buffer. That was the clipping part. That's removed, and now we have a a, a dedicated clipping stage. Okay. And then this thing describes the the clipping algorithm in here. And if you um, if you build the Java docs, you get a slightly easier to read version of that README. Okay, there's the README as a Java doc page. Okay, so you can just there's a bunch of, and, and what this, I, the, the stuff about clipping is here, improved line clipping. So this still describes the three stages of the pipeline. So this document, if it, it includes everything we did before. So it still has uh, the description of the scene, camera, and model lines. So we've got vertex data structures. It talks about the scene. So this is all copied from the previous render. So essentially it's just, I've, I've just grown the documentation. So there's a description of the frame buffer. There's a description of the renderer, okay? The renderer is now, but now the renderer is these three pipeline stages. Here's the same description of projection. Projection hasn't changed. And then here's the part that's new, the improved line clipping in the, ren in the renderer, okay? So this, this describes the clipping algorithm. We'll discuss that in a minute. And then after the clipping algorithm, it starts talking about rasterizing, and this is pretty much the same description as before. It's the same rasterizer, okay? The only difference is now when a pixel's out here, 
it, 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 the rasterizer now assumes that you never have pixels out here. So it doesn't check for a pixel outside the frame buffer. It just doesn't, it doesn't, oh, it could still, I think I removed the code that did that because it should never happen anymore. But it, uh, the rasterizer right now, since we will clip before we uh, rasterize, there won't be anything outside this window. So there won't be anything outside this logical viewport. So there won't be anything outside this frame buffer. That shouldn't happen anymore, okay? And, and this renderer doesn't have the ability to turn off and on clipping. You don't get that folding anymore because now the, the clipping algorithm just doesn't allow anything to get, to get past it that would be outside of the, of the frame buffer, okay? So the frame buffer and the projection don't change, but the clipping does. So I'll go back up here to clipping. Okay. Okay. Here's what the here's what the the view rectangle looks like. The view rectangle are x's between negative one and one, and y's between negative one and one. And here's a picture of the view rectangle. There's this line x equal one. That's its right edge. X equals negative one is the left edge. Y equals one is the top edge. Y equals negative one is the bottom edge. These equations are important. We're gonna use these equations to figure out when something needs to be clipped. So we're gonna put a lot of emphasis on these. They're simple equations. X equals negative one is that vertical line. X equals plus one is that vertical line, but we're gonna to clip to those four lines, okay? If a, if a line segment looks like this, it doesn't need to be clipped, okay? So the, the clipping algorithm is a three-step algorithm. Step one, step two, step three. Step one is if both vertices are inside that rectangle, you're done, okay? So the clipping function will return true. The, the, we're gonna write a clipping function that returns true to mean draw the line and return false to mean the line doesn't get drawn. And we'll see in a minute what I, be, I mean by that, okay? So the clipping algorithm is gonna return true or false. True, draw the line, false, draw the line. Okay, now look at this line. This line is completely outside of the view rectangle. So the clipping algorithm will return false for that line. When the, when the clipping algorithm is asked to clip that line, it'll return false, meaning that line shouldn't be drawn, okay? Now, the, this is called rejection. Now, rejection is subtle. This is not rejection, okay? Draw both of these. Okay, you should be able to see both of them now. See that line segment? It's completely outside of that view rectangle. That's called trivial rejection. This line segment is entirely outside of that view rectangle, but that's not trivial rejection. That, this line needs to be clipped. And here's how, here's, it's, a, it's kind of a funny algorithm. It, you would think that you would just throw that line away because it's, it's outside of the view rectangle. So throw it away. But the algorithm isn't that smart. What the algorithm says is, the algorithm looks at that line and says, does the line work with clipping, is it all on one side of that line or does it straddle that line? If it's all on one side of that line, then you reject it. But if it straddles the line, you're gonna clip it to that line, okay? So you trivially reject a line segment when it doesn't straddle one of these four line segments. So if a line, straddles any one of these four line segments, it gets clipped until it doesn't straddle them. Okay, that's different than what you might think. You might think that, oh, it's outside the view rectangle, so reject it. But what we're gonna say is no, it straddles that line, so we're gonna clip it right there. We're gonna clip it right there. Now, after we clip it right there, what we'll do is we'll recursively reclip it. Because once we clipped it right there, now it no longer straddles that line, and then it looks like this picture, and we can reject it. Okay. So the clipping algorithm is to step one, check if you can accept the line. If you can't accept the line, step two is does it straddle? Well, we're, we're going to do it on the order. First check this edge, then check that edge, then check the top edge, then the bottom. We're going to do right, left, top, bottom in that order. Does it straddle the, the right edge? If it doesn't straddle the right edge, then we check does it straddle the left edge, okay? If it doesn't straddle the left edge, then we check does it straddle the top edge, okay? 
And if it doesn't straddle any one of the four edges, then it's then it can be rejected. Okay. Like here, it doesn't straddle this one. So we well, if it doesn't straddle an edge, then we reject it. If it straddles the edge, then we clip it. Okay. So if it if it doesn't cut this edge, it's rejected. If it cuts that edge, it's clipped, and then we recurse. Okay, when we recurse, it'll be checked. Does it cut that edge? No, so it'll be rejected. So this will get rejected on the second trip through the recursive algorithm. Okay. All right. Then uh let's see. Let me draw a picture. Oops. Let's draw a picture of another possible clipping scenario. Okay, so here's our here's our clipping window. Okay, and our clipping window has these four edges. No, oh, that wasn't. Yeah. Here is our clipping window. And the clipping window has these four edges. So, so there's one clipping edge. There's another clipping edge. There's another clipping edge, and there. Okay. So there's there's the four edges you clip on. Okay, we just drew a line segment that was, we just drew a line segment that kind of looked like, well, if it's in here, it's accepted. If it's out here, it's rejected because it's all on one side of this. Oh, darn it. Okay. There's the bottom edge. Okay, jeez. Okay, so that would be accepted. This would be rejected. This one gets clipped. It gets clipped on that edge first. After it's clipped on that edge, then what's left is from here to here, it's all on one side of that edge, so it gets rejected the second time through. Okay, now, let's see. Now, the order of clipping is you clip on this guy, first, and you clip on this line, second, and you clip on this line, third, and you clip on this line, fourth, okay? Now, what about a line that looks like, uh, take that line. Does it cross line one? No. So now we check, does it cross line two? Yes, so we have to clip it. So we'll clip it here at line two. Then we start the clipping algorithm over again. Okay, so we'll clip it like that, all right? Then we start the clipping algorithm over again. We recurse. Does it cross line one? No. Does it cross line two? No, trivially rejected. So it got trivially rejected on the second pass. Okay? So that's 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 an example of a line that would get rejected. It would get clipped once, then rejected on the second pass. Okay, let me draw, a, a, let's look at another example. Let's see. Um, No, oh, not that. No. Oh, there. I think that one. Yeah. Does it cross line one? No, because it's it never gets. It, does it cross line two? No. Does it cross line three? 
No. Does it cross line four? Yes, it crosses line four. Okay. All right. It crosses line four. So now we clip it on line four. And now we recurse, and now on the second pass through, doesn't cross line one, doesn't cross line two, doesn't cross line three, but it does cross line four. No, it doesn't cross line four. It's entirely on, uh, yeah, over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Oh, no. I, I, I did this one wrong. It doesn't cross line one, but it's fully on this side of line two. This one, would, this one would be rejected on the second pass, on the first pass. This one would get rejected on the first pass because it doesn't cross line one. It doesn't cross line two, but it's on one side of line two. Notice that it, it doesn't cross line two. It's entirely on this side of line two. So this line actually doesn't get clipped. It gets rejected on the second, on the second line test. It, it doesn't get clipped on this line. It doesn't get clipped on this line, but it's all on one side of this line, so it just gets rejected. Okay, let's see. Now, what would be something that gets clipped on line four? Let me see if we can do something that gets clipped on. Would it have to go through line two, three, and four? Yeah, it might. It, yeah, probably. You, you don't get to, you can't have something that only gets clipped on line. Let me see. Can you get something that only gets clipped on line four? Because if you try to draw it outside of here, it's going to always be on one side of one of the other lines. So to get it to clip on line four, you're going to have to have it also get clipped on some other lines beforehand. Let's see. Yeah, if you have an idea, it can draw on the picture too. Um, I can? Yeah, yeah. See, okay, what about that line? Um, okay, okay. Does it, it doesn't cross line one, okay? It doesn't cross line two. It doesn't cross line three. Okay. Okay. Now it does cross line four. So what are we going to do? Clip it. Clip. Oh, oh, don't you erased it? Put it. Oh, I'll put it there. Uh, I didn't do anything. Oh, <laughs> somebody. Okay. <laughs> I was okay. trying to draw, but I couldn't. So I. Oh, gave okay. Up. So it's there. So it was it, like here. Okay. There. This line oh. here. Okay. Doesn't cross line one, doesn't cross line two, doesn't cross line three. Now it does cross line four, so it gets clipped, okay? So it'll get clipped and we'll clip off the part that doesn't belong. But now what happens? Now you recurse and... It gets drawn. It gets, it gets accepted, yeah, it gets drawn, okay? So that was an example of something that would be clipped on line four, but then it'll be accepted, not rejected. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking if you started in the upper left corner and cross through line three outside of the box, outside of the drawing plane. Okay, let's see. Start in the upper like left up by where, Yeah, like up by where it says clipboard, kind of. Start up here. Yeah, so you pass through line three and four and two without going inside the drawing. Yeah, like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now that's a good example because what now what now what order is that going to be clipped in? Okay. Doesn't cross one. Oh look, it crosses two. So we clip it here. So clip it one time because it crossed two. All right. Now start the clipping algorithm over again, recurse. Does it cross one? No. Does it cross two? No. Does it cross three? Yes. Oh, but, oh no, but take it back. What happened here? Oh, it's all to one side of two? Yeah, so it would get, it would get on the second pass, <laughs> uh, it would get, so yeah, it doesn't would get matter clipped. what you do. Sorry. It would get clipped once and then get rejected. <laughs> so that line would have been clipped once and then rejected on line two. So it got so, rejected on line two the second time through. Okay. So a portion of it has to be within the drawing. Uh, let's see, you can keep playing around with these. Uh, yeah, it depends on what you want to do. You, you can get all kinds of different orders of clipping by playing around with these things. Let's 
let's see what else um The maximum number of times you can clip is four times. And that's shown in this document here. Farther down here, there's this extreme clipping example. So this gets clipped four times. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's something. Was that another? Was that an example? I mean, my example, yeah, like this. Yeah, okay. starting in the upper right. Yeah, I, I started, yeah, but okay, let's see. Let's see. It, does it cross line one? Yes. So we clip it once to get rid of this part. Where's my eraser? Oh, don't, I'll leave the line. Oh, did, let's see. So I'm not touching anything. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I can't erase that because it's not on my screen. Yeah, it's not part of my screen. So, so I want a line that goes like this, right? Okay. Now, okay. Crosses line one. So clip it once. See, I may not, I may not have drawn it quite right. Okay, cross line one. See, now it doesn't cross line four. Let's see. I think I wanted it. Well, it started in the upper right. Like this, I think. Okay, so let's try. It. Clip on line one. Okay. Then start over again. Now it passes line one. Go over here to line two. Oh, you have to clip on line two. Start all over again. Passes line one, passes line two. Oh, now I have to clip on line three. So I clip on line three. Start all over again. Passes line one, passes line two, passes line three. Oh, I have to clip on line four. That's the fourth time it gets clipped. And now start all over again. Pass, well, now it's trivial except. See, so it needed to be clipped four times and then it becomes trivially except. So it had to be clipped on all four of the lines. So. Here's, a, here's an example that went from upper right to lower left, and this was went from upper left to lower right. Okay, so you could possibly clip a line as many as four times. Okay, all right, so that's the clipping algorithm. It, it, it does this process of, it does it one line at a time. If you're entirely on one side of that line, you're rejected. If you cross the line, you're clipped. But first, before, but the first thing it does is check if you are, first it checks if you're entirely inside. If you're entirely inside, then if you're not entirely inside, you have to cross one of the four lines. So then it checks the line one at a time. Are you entirely on one side of that line, the right side of that line? If yes, reject. If no, clip, okay? Then it'll go to line two. If you're entirely on the left of line two, reject. If you cross line two, clip. Then it'll go to line three. If you're entirely above line three, clip, otherwise, well, if you're entirely above line three, reject, otherwise clip it. Okay. And then, then, then it goes to line four. Okay, so it does line one, two, three, four. For line one, reject is to the right of it. For line two, reject is to the left of it. For line three, reject is above it. And for line four, reject is below it. Okay, all right, so now that's, the, that's the order of the algorithm. Now the de next step is, what do you do to actually clip a line? How do you actually clip a line. Okay, so now let's start, talk about that part of the algorithm. What do you do to actually clip a line that crosses, you know, you've got one of these four, I always use this one as the example, but it could be any one of the four, you know, it could be any one of these four line segments. I'll use this one as the main example, but the equations are pretty similar for the other three. So I'm going to use this one as the example of, of crossing, okay? So you're going to cross the line x equal 1. So here, here's an example. Here I got it, the vertex v0 outside. Now notice every one of these lines has an outside and an inside. The outside is the part that's being clipped off, and the inside is the part being kept. Now, like, I'm not talking about the outside and inside of this 
of this square. I'm just talking about essentially the outside and inside of each of these lines. Like for example, for this line here, outside would be above it and inside would be below it. The part that you want to clip off and the part you want to keep. So for this line, outside is above and inside is below. For this line, inside is above and outside is below, okay? So for, for the line x equal one, this stuff is, well, this vertex is outside, this vertex is inside. So the line segment's moving this direction. I could have easily put V0 over here and V1 over here and have, you know, essentially be going from inside to outside, okay? But here I'm going from outside to inside. Here's the main idea, this equation right here. This is something you saw in linear algebra. This is called the vector parametric, or you saw it in linear algebra and also possibly in Calc 3. We're gonna use this thing a lot. It, it's called the LERP formula. It's also called the vector parametric equation of a line, okay? But here's what, read this thing real easily. It's, it's not hard to read it. I've got a vertex V0 and a vertex V1. I want to describe all the points that are between here. I want to describe the line, the points on the line. Now I'm going to use a parameter T to describe all the points between V0 and V1. And T is going to be between 0 and 1. Okay. What about when T is 0? When T is 0, 0 times V1 is 0. So when T is 0, that goes away. 1 minus 0 is 1. So I just have the point V0. So the way we say it is at time T1, I'm sitting there. At time T1, on time T0, at time 0, when T is 0, I'm sitting there. Because when T is 0, 0 times V1 is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. 1 times V0 is 1. Now what happens when I get to time 1? Well, at time 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So this is gone, and one times V1 is one. So at time one, I'm up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna describe moving on this line, starting at time zero over here, and at time one here. And I want it so that at time a half, I'm in the midpoint. At time a quarter, I'm one quarter of the way across. At time three quarters, I'm three quarters of the way across. At time 0.9, I'll be 90% of the way from here to here. At time Point one, I'll be 10% of the way from here to here. This is, that's why it's called, this is called linear interpolation. I'm interpolating between this point and this point in a linear way, meaning when T is a half, I'm halfway between them. When T is 0.7, I'm 70% of the way from here to here, okay? Now, another way to think about it, it's, it's like an average. I'm really saying what's the average of this point and this point with weights t and one minus t, okay? I'm weighing, you also see this a lot in statistics. You'll see this formula all the time in statistics because it's called a weighted average. I've got two things, a v, here a vertex zero and a vertex one, and I wanna know what are all the averages between, that can have, what are all the possible averages? The normal averages was when t equals one half. That's what you think of as the average. That's the regular average. But then I can ask, well, what are all the possible weighted averages where I put more weight on this one and less weight on this one, okay? So when T is between zero and a half, okay? When T is between zero and a half, I'm putting more weight on this one and less weight on this one. Because when T is between zero and a half, I have one minus T weight here and weight T here. So at first I'm putting more weight on this one and less weight on this one. Then when I get to t equals a half, I have equal weight on both of them, and I'm in the middle. Then when t is larger than a half, I've got more weight on this one. Like when t is three quarters, three quarters of the weight is on v1, and one quarter of the weight is on v0, okay? So if I think of it as a weighted average, and I'm saying this is the weight. See, some people put the letter w here instead of t. I'm thinking of it as time. I'm moving across this line. At time zero, I'm here. And I'm moving with constant velocity so that at time one, I land here. Other people would use the letter W here. You're taking weights. You're weighing this point by a certain amount and weighing this point by the complementary amount. This would be the weight on this point and the complementary weight, one minus T, on that point. So in statistics, they would probably write this as a W here. 
for give me the point at every possible weight between here and here. Okay. What we're going to do is solve for t when we cross that line. t is an unknown. We're going to write the equation that says, at what time t do I hit that line x equals 1? The way I do that is take this equation and write it in, as its x and y components. See, that is a point as a function of t. Every point has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. So I take this equation and I write it in its x-coordinate and its y-coordinate. Um, I probably should have put an inter intermediate step in between there. Okay. Um, if I go over here, I can, I, here I can write. P of T equals, what's well, a point? So it's got an X of T and a Y of T. See? P of T is a point in the plane. So it's got an X coordinate depends on T and a Y coordinate depends on T. Okay? So now here's the point. What's its X coordinate? What's well, X coordinate is going to be 1 minus t times the x coordinate of v naught, x naught, plus t times the x coordinate of v1. Okay, so there's the x coordinate of p. Okay, then I can go over here and ask for the y coordinate of p. Okay, so over here I will write the y coordinate. Well, it's 1 minus t times the x coordinate of v1, the x coordinate of v1. The, the x coordinate of v1 would be written x1. What's the, um, oh, what I, I wrote something wrong here. No, I'm sorry. I'm doing the y coordinate. It's y, y, zero. It's confusing, right? See, it's y. See, it's the. I'm now in the y component of this guy. So it's one minus t times the y component of v zero. That be y zero. Okay. Then plus t times. Now I need the y component of v one. So that be y one. Okay. So. I took this point PT, I wrote it as having an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. There's the X coordinate of PT, and there's the Y coordinate of PT, and then I just wrote those out here as two separate equations. Okay, so I wrote, the, I wrote X of T is this, and Y of T is this. So you did this, in, this is something you do in 261 all the time take an equation like this and write out its x and y components. Okay, so there's the x and y components. Now, what's interesting, we want to know, we want to know that the, the, the x component moves from this number across to that number there. See, this number has got an x naught and a y naught. And this one has got a x1 and a y1. Okay. This one's got an x1 and a y1. This one's got a X naught and a Y naught. So the X goes this way while the Y coordinate goes this way. Okay, we want to know when does the X coordinate hit one? So the X coordinate is going to go this way. We want to know when does it hit one? Okay, so we want to solve for when this guy is one. That's this equation here. I want to know when. Does this guy hit 
x equals one. As I'm moving along this diagonal, my x coordinates moving across that way. See, as I go along, as t changes, I move along the diagonal. But as t changes, the x coordinate drops down from x one to from x zero to x one. I want to know when does t hit one? When does t at what t does this point hit one? Now notice that this has only got one unknown in it, the t at this point. I know x not. I know where I start. And I know x one. I know where I end. Remember, I know these points. I know this one. And I know this one. So even though they're written as letters, they're they're not unknowns, they're knowns. So I know this number and I know this number. I don't know when I get there. Okay. Yeah. So 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 you can think of this as when is x equal to t, or x equal to one. When is t? I'm solving for t. So when because I'm thinking of time. I'm, I'm traveling from here to the left. When do I hit t equals one? When do I hit x equals one? When does this component hit one? Okay, now that's, that leaves t as an unknown. I can solve for it. So here's the formula. There's the solution. There's when I hit this line here. Okay. Now I know when I hit that line there. So now I can compute the y coordinate. Now I can take that t and plug it into here. I can take this t and plug it into this equation and find out where I am, okay? And that's done down here. Now I can say, what is the y? You know, as I'm traveling across this line, so you know, I started down here and I travel up this way. I know when I hit that x equals one, so now I can figure out where I am, there's the y coordinate, okay? So I take that t, and plug it into the y equation. I take that t, plug it into the y equation up here, take t, plug it into y, do the algebra, and here's where the crossing point is. That's where I clip at. I clip at that thing, okay? These equations just get built into the renderer. Yeah, the renderer just needs this formula is built into the render that says when we hit that line, and then you plug that into the y equation, and then this is plugged into the render, and that gives you the point you cut off. So now you know how, where that point is. So now the v0 can be cut off right there. Okay? All right. So that's, run out of time, that's the clipping algorithm. The, the heart of it is, this formula here. The heart of it is that formula, the, this, way, this, in, this, this LERP formula, it's got a name, it's called LERP, linear interpolation. The heart of it is that formula there. This says, I'm gonna move from here to here, start here at time zero, end here at time one, and I wanna know when did I hit x equals one? Solve for when I hit x equals one, yeah, and then I can tell you where I am when I hit x. Yeah. If I know when I hit that point, I can say where I am, and that gives me the y point that replace that vertex with. Okay, that we're going to use this interpolation formula a lot of places. I didn't mention ago, it appears everywhere in statistics. In probability and statistics, this thing appears over and over again. And we're going to actually, it's an amazingly useful formula. So we're going to use it in a bunch of different places in the renderer. Okay, it, it turns out to just be, it, it just lets you, it's also called the morphing formula. It lets you transform or morph one thing into another. You can think of this thing as sort of morphing into that point. You're transitioning from there to there. We're gonna see that there's a lot of times when we wanna do that kind of thing. So this formula, the LERP formula is gonna appear over and over again. And um, just one last thing, if you Google LERP, it's what it's pronounced. It's uh, linear interpolation. So if you just Google LERP, L-E-R-P, see there's the formula. Yeah, there's a picture of it. Yeah, um, it's just ubiquitous everywhere. 
in science and engineering. You know, they say the basic operation of linear interpolation. Okay. And it, it's not just a rendering thing. It's, it's a thing that's everywhere in engineering. Okay. Lerps just appear all over the place. Okay. And we're, gonna, we're using it once here and we'll use it several other times in several other places in the render. It's worth, it's worth really thinking hard about this formula because you'll see it used over and over and over again <clears throat> in all kinds of places in science and engineering. This, this, this idea of saying, I've got a starting point and an ending point, and I want to know what are all the in-betweens. It's actually even called in-betweening. Some people actually refer to it as, I bet if I Google, in betweening, uh, people in animation refer to it as in betweening, finding the thing that's in between two things. Okay, and it's done actually by lerping. Okay, so lerping and in betweening. Eventually, if you go, if you read about this, you'll probably see the lerp formula. See, notice here they're showing it as an animation thing. What's in between that frame and that frame? Yeah, that's called in betweening, and it's solved by linear interpolation. You want to know what are the things in between here and here. So anytime you have to transition from A to B, and you'd like to know what's in between the A and the B, as I transition from A to B, that problem shows up all over and over again, and that's linear interpolation or in betweening. Okay, so we'll quit there, um, and we'll we'll look at the code on um, on Thursday. We'll look at the code for this. Okay, so this is the formulas, and we'll see how the formulas get translated into code. Okay, and um, so if you have questions, especially if you have questions about the homework assignment, let me know, and then we'll finish this interpolation stuff on Thursday by looking at the code for it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and uh, see you on Thursday. Bye.